Hi, this is Tim and Joel. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Hey folks, we just wanted to give a shout out and, and a thank you for uh, watching the episodes and subscribing. And then uh, also remind you of the benefits of hitting that subscription or subscribe button down below. Uh, Tim, the, the benefits of that subscribe button? I mean, it really helps us a lot. Uh, it allows us to present our case to our, to our sponsors. And with that, we give basically everything we get from our sponsors, we give back to you as, as audience. So um, it helps us offset our expenses from a uh, equipment perspective. I mean, to speak of, I would say, hey, we make no money on this. This is, it's really about trying to provide a good quality product to you as listeners. Yeah, so if you, if you don't mind, hit that subscribe button. You're going to get notifications of new episodes and other benefits from that. So, again, we want to leave you with a big thank you for uh, watching and supporting the uh, Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbass Show. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Nose Jammer contains vanillin and other natural aromatic compounds that have the ability to effectively jam an animal's sense of smell. Just like an overly bright light can wash out a photographic image, Nose Jammer overwhelms the olfactory system and overpowers an animal's ability to detect and track human scent. Hunting in the wrong wind? Jam them with Nose Jammer. Welcome to Midwest Hunting Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Um, the episode today is, we're calling it Summer Whitetails. Summer Whitetails. And we've got a couple special guests, but before we get to our special guests, Tim, let's talk about, uh, you know, what's up with your world. Um, first of all, thanks for making it. Yep. I know it's a challenge with time and uh, with the special assignment, but um, what's, what's going on in uh, your world? So still on special assignment. Uh... I've been spending quite a bit of time up in the Milwaukee, Dallas areas, um, and that's going to continue as it as it appears. Um, but with a uh, hunting perspective, I've got my CRP, I think, pretty well under control. Uh, I've done two mowings, probably going to do a third. It's getting a little late to do my third mowing, but uh, I'm probably still going to do it because it's better than to have the weeds. Um, the other thing is, is uh, hey, we're, we're approaching middle of August, and... I still don't have any food plots, Joel. It's a it's a problem, and uh, so not seeing any deer on my cameras. So obviously they're where the food's going to be at. So I think what I'm going to do is today after our show I'm going to go out mow, mow, pick up my tiller that I shelled out this uh, this summer, and uh, do some tilling, and uh, plant some food plots. And nice. We'll see we'll see how it plays out. Nice. You get a busy day, honey. Busy day. Yeah, because yeah. we got a busy weekend, right? Which is cutting into your busy weekend. Yeah, yeah. Cool. How about yourself? Yeah. Thanks for asking. I'm going to move here a little bit. Um, super weekend. As I was talking on the phone with you the other day, is, is like till October or November. I can't envision it being a more exciting week than what I just had this week. So, as you know, we we made a big uh, food plot run to IMH. Uh, one of our sponsors, and then we picked up uh, Radix blinds. Um, and uh, one of those blinds needed to be assembled and installed, and we, my wife and I did that Tuesday and Wednesday. So we spent six, eight hours uh, building this Tinker Toy uh, tree stand and cutting a, getting the chainsaw out with the mower and cutting a path into the woods and uh, got it down below where we wanted it. And uh, man, it feels good having that done. Absolutely. And then last Friday, right before we got two inches of rain, I was out here tilling and mowing and got all my food plots tilled and seeded. And then you four, hit the hours, four hours later, two inches of rain. I'm like, perfect. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't, that's never happened before. Never, ever <laughs> happened. But uh, anyway, that, that's, you know, that's, uh, I feel good right now. Talk to me in two or three weeks after 100 degree weather and it hasn't rained for. Well, it's whatever. supposed to rain this weekend, maybe. So. I know. So the other thing is, is hey, uh, we want to tell the audiences that uh, we're in talks with uh, another significant sponsor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go so, ahead. 
So we're, we're not right there yet, so we haven't reached an agreement, but uh, super excited about it, and it'll mean a lot to our viewers as well. So more to come on that. Okay, so yeah. we're gonna leave that like hanging, yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, okay. next, next week I think we should have it wrapped up. Yeah, if you don't hear anything, it means it was bad news. Yeah, bad news. <laughs> that's, but that's, that's how it works, right? <laughs> but hey, enough about us. Let's, um, let's uh, introduce our, our guests here. So Tyler, you're, uh, a mainstay here. You want to introduce yourself and then Heath, thanks for, thanks for coming. We're going to talk yeah, whitetails. Sure. Well, thanks guys for, for having us both on again. Um, as I'm sure some of your listeners probably know, my name is Tyler Harms. I'm the biometrician currently for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, also currently serving in the role as our deer program leader. Um, so a lot of what I do on a, on a regular day, basis as it relates to the deer program is uh, mostly population management. So I'm looking at the numbers, setting the county antlerless license quotas every year, uh, help with managing our chronic wasting disease response plan and, and tracking some, some other deer diseases in, in that regard as well. So, um, so yeah, I'm doing a lot of the, the kind of the population management stuff in cooperation with our, our uh, wildlife biologists around the state. Yeah, the, um, the wildlife math guy, right? Yeah, is that's that right. The, that's is that right. the tag that we've tagged you with? I or think maybe that's what we tagged the last time I or think maybe so. a couple times ago, yeah. 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 And uh, Heath, you're new, new to the program. Tell I us am. a little bit about Heath. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, my name is Heath Van Wass. I'm the Rathen Wildlife Unit Biologist. So essentially, uh, the DNR is broke up into 16 wildlife units across the state. So I'm in charge of the Rathen Unit, which is five counties and right around 30,000 public hunting acres that the unit there at Rathman manages. So we do wow. a variety of things, basically anything when it comes to wildlife management on our public areas from prescribed burning to waterfowl banding to uh, timber sand improvement on some of our areas. You know, it's just pretty much any sort of management that, that we want to do on the state areas to improve them, you know, putting in food plots like you guys talked about. We do that. We do, I don't even know how many acres we do ourselves, but you know, just basically anything habitat management related on, mm -hmm. on the public areas to try to make it better for our, for our guys and gals that are out there hunting the, the public stuff. I tell you what, we're talking food plots again. Last year, it must have been middle of November, whew, my food plots were smoked. I mean, they, they had gone through and cleaned it out. Hmm. Yeah, we, we saw that a lot on our public areas too. A lot of times we try to do a, a fallow rotation on some of our crops for some of the birds and some of the other things. And the deer and everything had everything cleaned out by the time we come around this spring to, to assess what we had out there. It was a pretty rough winter on, on a lot of things. And we're, we're definitely seeing that. I know this is more geared towards deer, but we're definitely seeing it in our, our upland population this, this spring and summer, so. Don't you wonder, I mean, do you think that that maybe like last year, we didn't have a big mast crop and, you know, since there wasn't a big mast crop, they they were just foraging for anything they could find. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes, that does make a difference when, when the oak trees are not throwing all that all that nutrients out on the ground, you know, they got to go out and search for, for other things to eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, we got snow, quite a little bit of it. And at least here between the big snows, there was about 10 inches of snow and then a little layer of ice mm -hmm. and then more snow on top. So it was just, I mean, I was, it was during hunting season yet, like late hunting season. I'm in the mouse hut is what I call it. Cause there's more mice in there than there are hunters, but uh, I was in the mouse hut out here. And I mean, the deer, you could just see them trying to get through that ice and it was just difficult as hell. And that's a deer, you know, yeah. upland birds and turkeys and pheasants, and quail, no way. Yeah. Iowa, Iowa winters can be brutal sometimes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, most of the time, some of the worst snow comes up in the Northern part of the state, but the ice I think is really what has a negative effect on a lot of those populations down in this in this part of the state. Yeah, Absolutely. I think it was a bad combination of snow and ice and then the temperatures were pretty brutal yeah. uh, for a yeah. week or two there. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about whitetails, guys. So um, we're, again, we're labeling this episode summer whitetails. We're right in the heat of uh, summer. We're a week away, I think, from uh, licenses going on sale yeah. a week from today. Well, 15th is 15th. usually so yeah. a week from tomorrow. Yep. So that dates the episode. Um, <laughs> we uh, are that close to getting licensed. And what, as hunters, landowners, you know, um, conservationists, what should we be thinking about whitetails this time of year and over the summer? 
So first of all, what does the social aspect of whitetails look like right now? You got bucks and you got fawns and you got does and are they, what's that look like? Educate us. Well, right now during the summer months, uh, you know, the bucks are usually in their bachelor groups as, you know, as us hunters are out there looking, trying to assess what we got out there on our properties. You're seeing a lot of those bucks hanging out together. Whereas the does are very solitary, you know, the spring and summer months where they're they're raising or, you know, having their fawns and then also raising them um, in a different, usually in a different location than a lot of the, the bachelor group bucks because they want, they want to be with their fawn to make sure that their fawn's making it through the summer. Um, home ranges are usually pretty small during the summer. You know, the bucks are staying close to their food. Both, both the does and the bucks are just, you know, really putting the feed bag on in the summer, just trying to get their body conditioning back up to get ready for the fall breeding seasons and making it through the winter. So, you know, they, the role reverse, uh, the role is kind of reversed in the fall, you know, like the bucks are kind of more solitary and spread out and do some more things where the does kind of groove up a little bit more in the fall and the winter, you know, in the summer, the bucks, the bucks are together. So yeah, home ranges are smaller, bucks are together. And then the does are, you know, by themselves taking care of their fawns usually this time of year. Interesting. Now the uh, let's let's stay with the does first of all. The does, I've, you know, I'm, a, I'm a doe. I've got a fawn, maybe a twin or even triplets. Hopefully, um, am I with other does or am I like totally? You know? most, most of the time, the does are by themselves when they're raising their fawns. I don't know exactly. You know, depending on where you're at in the state and what your habitat looks like, there might be a few does that stay within you know a certain chunk, but they. They kind of have their little home core area and they don't want another mother and fawn because you know they want to try to make sure that their fawn has enough nutrients and they can also get enough food and everything to reduce the milk needed to get their fawn you know to adulthood so they're in, they're not in super close proximity but there are there are does that are fairly close together sometimes interesting and then are they uh, when when do they start weaning weaning the fawns going going away from milk um ooh, that's a tough question there. that is a tough question it's well it, it 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 depends on when the fawn was born you know too you know i've yep. as we've all shot does early <laughs> season maybe even you season or october 1st there's some of those does that are still producing milk you know hmm. so i think a lot of it just kind of depends on maybe the health of the doe or the fawn and then also maybe when that fawn was dropped so it could be anywhere anytime in the summer that's that's kind of a tough question because you don't yeah. really know know when when those fawns were dropped and the overall health of both the, both you know, the creatures there you know just kind of echoing what you're you're saying is, is i am on film seeing most of the, my does off by themselves usually i have not no triplets but mine are usually twins or sing singles but uh the other piece i'm seeing is is uh the size difference in the fawns i've seen some fawns that are pretty small i mean obviously bigger than rabbits but but pretty but pretty small I saw one last night and then I've got some that the spots are already starting to fade off so it's interesting about how much time frame but obviously between those when those two sets were born right yeah and it's interesting I think we see that Tim you know obviously there's variability just across the board right but a lot of times I think where where you really see the variability is between the um, if you have yearling yearling does so yearling does last year that are getting bred versus adult does those yearling does tend to get bred a little bit later and so they're ten they tend to have fawns a little bit later whereas the you know year and a half two and a half year old does are you know they're going to get bred kind of right in that that um, prime time and so they're going to be a little bit more consistent on when they when they have have their fawns so um, I think that drives quite a bit of the variability, but then obviously, as Heath mentioned too, there's variability within those sure. as well. Just kind of depends interesting. On the time. Doe comes into heat. I mean, let's say it's Halloween. Mm -hmm. You know, er, you know, there's <laughs> all kinds of this. Yes. This yeah. is not the episode to discuss when the rut is happening, right? Yeah. But let's just to say Halloween. It, it's my understanding that if the doe, you know, doesn't get bred, then it will go what, 28 days, 30 days, and come back into heat again? She will come back into heat. I don't know the exact time frame, exactly when she'll come back in, but yeah, she'll come back into estrus and hopefully get bred the second Ready, time around. Bred a second yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that could be that could be some of it too, because I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing 
some pretty significant differences in the height of the of the fonts. Huh. Okay. Interesting. I'm seeing a lot of fonts. Are you guys? Yeah. Is we that have, the? We've been seeing a lot of. We talked about it on the way here. You know, I have a pretty long commute to my office each day, and I've I've stopped my car more times for those this summer than I have in a long time. You know, going to and from. <laughs> You know where their fawns are at, or where they might be feeding. And we've I've been seeing a lot of twins. You know, not a lot of singles. So, which is good. Which means you know they went into the winter or came out of the winter in pretty good Healthy. health. So I think the overall population this this fall and for this hunting season should be pretty good. Yeah, we're gonna close out this episode, Heath. Yeah. So don't let's don't let the, <laughs> okay. the so cat out of the bag here on predictions, right? Okay. But I'm I'm seeing a lot of fawns. So we'll we'll see. So what hey, I know that I know we're talking whitetail, but are you guys seeing many? Uh, turkey poults i've actually seen more turkey poults this year than i've ever seen in this neck of the woods mm. so i've been doing the turkey survey okay yeah uh and i've probably i've probably put in probably a dozen entries so far sure i've only seen two poults hmm. i've um i could eat you i've only seen one i've seen i think between the last two months i've probably seen over 100 turkey poults that's just good. out and about and, I, and in my position anymore i don't get out as much as i used to when i was actually out doing a lot of this stuff on the areas but yesterday i was checking a new area for a new prairie scene you talk about mowing your crp and there was a a hen that jumped up with 10 poults probably pheasant size and then one of my guys was doing his august roadside survey where we go out and count quail and pheasants and rabbit populations each august and he actually saw a brood of turkeys two days ago that were this big you know, so she was a very, very late hatcher. So it's 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 pretty amazing what those birds will do to keep nests. And we talked about, you know, does coming back into estrus. You know, the upland birds or any sort of ground nesting bird will kind of do the same thing. You know? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's good because we've been too scared. Uh, hopefully it's just two data points that uh, yeah. I've seen a lot. Well, I mean, we know that there's a lot of variability in that too, right? So... By, yeah. area, by area, yep. yeah, yeah, yep. for sure. Hey, um, one more question on this, and then we'll move on uh, down the agenda. But um, we, we talked a lot about does. What about the bucks? And so they're bachelor groups. A bachelor group might be two, three, four bucks. I think a lot of it's regional. Depends on where you're at. I mean, I've seen bachelor groups up to eight to ten. You know, okay. and, it, wow. and it varies from you know five and a half year old, you know, old mature bucks all the way down to you know your one and two year olds. So it, it can kind of just, it just varies on what kind of habitat you got. But I'd say, I'd say an average batch of groups probably in that four to five range usually. Yeah. I was running my roadside route last week, as Heath mentioned, we're doing those statewide right now. And I saw a bachelor group run across me and, uh, in front of me on the road that was four. And it was a, just a train. It had the oldest buck in the front and the, just a little spike buck in the back. So. So my follow-up question on that is either scientifically or your guys' opinion. You know, I keep hear, hearing about this toady theory, right? And the toady theory is big buck always hangs out with at least one smaller, younger buck who's their toady. And the toady oh, is, <laughs> the you know, the design of the toady is, A, you're going to be kind of the scout here. I'm going to use you as the lead. Uh, any, you know what I'm saying? From a safety standpoint. So he's a sacrificial toady. That, uh, to uh. That's what he's kind of like, you know, I'm the rock star, you're the roadie. But now he's a he's toady. A toady. <laughs> you set up the band, I get the girls, right? That's how it works. What? Oh. what any oh, any insight on that? I'm not getting a good positive look on you non-verbally here. I mean, He's back big, to the toady. <laughs> the big buck was in the lead in the group that I saw the other day. So yeah. Well, I would uh, the batch of groups that I saw not too far away from my office the other day. The big one was in the back. So maybe there was three little ones in front of him. So maybe he had three toadies with him. Well, you guys are going to be thinking about that hunting this <laughs> I've year. I've never heard that. That's that. funny. Yeah. I'm going to start you collecting observations yeah. on this. Yeah. Theory I now. tell you what, I I see it a lot on so, trail cameras, and I see it somewhat. You know, in person. You so. sure you've heard about this, or is this just a Joel theory? I think it's a Joel theory. I've never heard of it. Mate. <laughs> so, are you, so you're saying if you're hunting and a small buck's come down the trail, you should just wait because the big one's falling? I, I'm, I'm no, saying. No, 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 no. I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting. Yeah. I'm saying. Summer. That He's thinking summer. It's statistically uh, high 
that when you see a small buck, that there is a big buck somewhere in the area of vicinity of it. And, and if you watch their mannerisms, the small buck is always out in front and the big buck will sit back and then when they feel good about it, they'll move up and hmm. so on. Kind and of so test in the water form, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to make my own observation. Well, yeah. you guys yeah. do that That's study, true. you know. Remember where you heard it first, okay? But we'll the make sure to give you a yeah. shout heard out. Heard it from a dumbass. <laughs> 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 Remember the show's name here, Pete. But, uh, all right, sorry, sorry. Let's let's get off that. Um, let's, let's get back on track, Joel. Yeah, I mean, no get, more digression. That's your job, isn't it? <laughs> uh, nutrition, from a deer standpoint, um, you know, it's early August going to the really heat of the summer and, and can be pretty dry. Um, what's important for these deer to continue to live and, and nurture uh, nutrition wise? And then where are they getting that food source? Uh, I guess I'll touch on that first. You know, I think as we all know, deer are browsers, you know, they're constantly moving. Uh, I think the biggest thing as, as a landowner, if you're trying to provide nutrition in the summer months, is to try to have some sort of diversity of variety out there for your whitetails, whether or not that be, you know, an annual food plot or maybe some stuff you're trying to get to grow in the summer. But also think about some of that natural food that those deer <coughs> have eaten for generations, you know, things that you can do within your timber to try to enhance that, that natural herbaceous layer. Because as you watch deer from the stand, I mean, they're always moving and eating, you know, and they're, they're selective they're concentrate selective eaters where in the summer, you know, there might be certain things that come up that are kind of a seasonal thing. Well, they'll target those. It's just, we were kind of talking about on the way here is for when we do our sunflower pots on our areas, they get to a certain growth point and those deer, there's something about that growth point that the deer love that. And they'll, I mean, they'll just annihilate some of those fields, but you got to think in the summer, there's, there's berries and there's apples and you know some of these other wild, things wild plums right right you know there's a lot of these things that are a very seasonal food kind of like us as humans like when when sweet corn rolls around i know my family was like all right sweet corn's here let's just eat it until we can't stand it anymore i think deer kind of the same way where they're they're seasonal type browsers where you know certain things are available and they're going to target those that time of year okay so hey let's talk about that Let's talk about that sunflower, that growth point. Mm -hmm. We're past that, right? Are we past that? We should be past it, yeah. Because I'm going to be taking down my electric fence. I wanted to make sure. So we we planted a uh, a dove plot okay. prototype, and uh, obviously remember the weed story. Mm -hmm. So it's loaded with weeds, but there's enough in there to create some interest, I think. But I'm going to take down the electric fence to put over my food plot today. Have the sunflowers headed out? Yeah. Oh yeah, you're fine. They get them before, it's almost right before they start to put the head on. Oh, really? You know, they're probably about three foot tall and they just nip it down. All the way down. And they're done. They're done. And they, I mean, you're just taking the growth point off and then the sunflowers don't produce the head. And mm -hmm. I've witnessed that. Yeah, I've seen that too. I mean, I, 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 I'm always fascinated that, you know, spend thousands of dollars on food plots and then I see a deer meandering through the woods or my food plots and they'll nibble on a weed. You know, yeah. a ragweed or a, a water hemp or something like that, and I'm like, man, eat all the water hemp they want. They can yeah. have it all, man. <laughs> they can have all of that, right? But yeah, I've, I've observed deer walk through a, a standing bean <clears throat> field to go eat locust pods. You know, it's some of that natural food that we we can't forget about that they that they really like because you know you touched on it a little bit earlier last year. You know, the acorn <clears throat> mass production wasn't that great. You know, so they try to take advantage of those natural foods when they're available as much as they can. Yeah. I mean, they still like the food plots and things that we try to put out for them, but you know, natural browse and things that you can do that are already in the environment is something that a guy shouldn't look past for sure. I think the important thing to remember too, like Heath mentions, variety, right? We don't like eating the same thing every day. They don't either, and that's and and they they really can't. Um, you know, I, I think a, a common misconception is that well, I can just I can just feed a deer corn every, all day, every day, and it'll be it'll be fine, and it'll it'll love it, and it, it might love it, but it's probably not going to be fine for it, right? Mm -hmm. And so they need that variety, and they seek that variety uh, from a nutritional standpoint. Right. Well, they better keep eating those locust pods because after this year, I'm going after them reckless. And <laughs> just the, the ones with thorns on, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. 
They breed like rabbits. That is that is interesting. Um, Lose a few ATV tires to those thorns, have Oh my you? gosh, I'm telling you, they're everywhere. They're bad. And they go through your rubber boots when you're walking. I've had that happen oh, before. Yeah. It's, it's painful. Iowa Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Keosauqua, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. So we talked in the last episode about how blessed we are to live in Iowa with the mm-hmm. corn and the beans. I mean, there's just so much agricultural support for deer and, and animals during the summer, during, you know, when things are available. Right. But as hunters, we're really thinking, okay, when the corn and beans are harvested, you know, what, what's going to be available for these deer moving forward? So well, what are some things that, um, you know, landowners or hunters should be thinking about planting? For, for fall hunting season. For the fall hunting season, going into late October, November, December, and making yeah. these deer through the winter. I think, it, I mean, it, it depends a little bit about how your farm lays. Maybe you don't have a lot of agriculture. Let's say there's enough neighboring agriculture where you don't, you're not worried about the grain aspect sort of thing. Um, and then you could also look at like, what is your preferred season to hunt? If you're strictly a bow hunter, maybe, you know, like radishes or some sort of brassica that is still green, during those October months where a lot of things, you know, that's when we start seeing some frost and some of their natural brows is just starting to lose its vigor there. So, you know, maybe obviously how your farm is set up, but also maybe the seasons that you want, you know, maybe you're a late season hunter where you want a turnips or some other standing grain where, where maybe the farmer had already harvested all some of his grain. So you want to try to focus those deer maybe on a certain plot. And, you know, obviously as, as the months go on, deer target different types of food. You know, when it gets colder and snowier, they're focusing on corn and beans. You know, beans is high in protein and corn is high in carbohydrates. So it has, you know, a little bit of everything that they need there. So, right. So, yeah. What, um, what's the, you, you talked about 30,000 acres that you're involved with managing what are what are some of the products that are you guys use in your food plots um so we try to when we do our food plots it's kind of for all wildlife not necessarily deer but we do historically we've done sorghum beans corn we're starting to do a lot more um cereal grains in the fall which is which is good browse because we usually try to plant that in October, so late <laughs> September, so it's coming up. Like a winter weed? Yeah, or? like a winter weed, or we've actually been experimenting <laughs> with um, triticale, which is a hybrid between wheat and rye. It does a little bit better in wetter soils, and some of our areas are kind of down in the floodplains and stuff. So it's a, it's a fairly cheap seed. It grows pretty quick in the fall. You know, it's got your nice short green browse where the deer, it stays green pretty much until the snow covers it up. So it's just a different component out there for, for the deer. But then when it comes up in the spring, it's good for brood, brood ring for any sort of birds. And then the deer will also target that next fall when it, when it heads out. But we do some turnips and radishes around, around the areas. Um, but we also focus too on our timbers, <coughs> doing some sort of timber stand improvement to try to get that herbaceous layer. Um, we've also seen the deer really target those those stumps that next summer even that fall you know mineral stumps where you got that those new sh- um shoots with those deer just they love those things they're just super high in nutrition so something to think about too you know within your timber not necessarily out in the open where we're you just kind of looking at each other because we've got an episode out there folks go out and check that episode out on uh creating brows for your deer okay. so and that's cool. exactly yep. exactly what we uh we've done so you both hunters what are you guys' uh, secret weapons that you put in your food plots in the fall? <coughs> if you can, you know, if I could weasel it out of you. Uh, I'm, I mean, I do a little bit of both. I do both bow hunting and shotgun hunting. Um, I like the radish side of things when it comes to bow hunt. It's a nice green browse for them. It's just, I, like, I just like watching deer eat it, too. It's fun to watch them walk across the Nebraska field with a big old chunk of lettuce <laughs> hanging out of their mouth. You know, it just, it's a good spot in mid to late october where the does are coming to you know and that's obviously an area where you know when the ruts starting you know those bucks are going to come through there and check some of that stuff out but yeah you know that's a good question joel i don't know if i have a 
a, a secret weapon. I'll, I'll share an observation though from last year during the season. Uh, so I hunt on my in-laws property over in Guthrie County and um, had, was hunting a, a stand uh, right by a, a picked cornfield. Uh, but my father-in-law plants cover crops on his cornfield, cereal, rye mix, I think is what it was last year. And I was really uh, surprised to see that the deer were just hammering that cover cover crop last year, which was interesting. So kind of similar deal, you know, they're out there pawing around in it and you know, they've got it hanging out of their mouth and stuff. And that was, that was <clears throat> interesting for me to see. I didn't, I guess I didn't expect that, but it's probably not too surprising. So. We've been talking about that. You put in some winter wheat this uh, spring, right? Yeah, I put in seven acres last year, and then I let five. I didn't do anything with it. I just let it head out mm -hmm. and let it fall to the ground, and it's kind of my little test. I'm going to see. Uh, it's in a it's in a bit of a wet ground, a triticale. Mm -hmm. If I don't know if I said that right. Yep, you're fine. Uh, that would be an ideal spot because it's a low land. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna let it sit there and we'll see if it comes back thicker next year. Okay. I'll learn something, uh, unless you got some insights already. I think if you're gonna to wanna to try to reseed that, maybe maybe try to mow some of it, mm -hmm. to try to scatter that seed, maybe this time, because it's headed out now. Yep. You know, I, we have really good mm -hmm. success. We, we try to manipulate some of that same mm -hmm. stuff when we do some of our dove banding. So we'll come in and mow it and get it short so we can try to trap those doves and it just, it's coming back the next year. I mean, that's the great thing about the cereal rice seed. It's almost, you just throw it out on the ground and it's gonna, gonna grow, grow, you yeah. know, that's, mm -hmm. and it just keeps coming back year after year. So it's a, it's a nice, cheap, easy food plot that a lot of different critters like. Yeah, you know? it is. I mean, so, it, the old saying is you can throw that stuff in the back of a pickup truck and it'll grow, right? Yeah. And it yeah. does, literally it, it's, uh, it's good stuff. So I'm gonna plant out another two acres of winter rye uh, cause I'd mowed it I had mowed it, I had some thoughts on what I was gonna do and I've changed my mind, so. Yeah. But I'm just growing it for browse. I mean, it's just pure habitat. Yeah. I know a lot of guys use cereal rye within their turnips and radish mix too, <laughs> just to kind of give it a little bit of variety out there for them too, because it, it stays green so much longer than, than your brassicas, you know? Yeah. yeah, I wonder if it's kind of a hidden gem just because it's so obvious, you know, and, and again, it's so cheap. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so versatile, but um, and easy to grow, and yeah. easy to grow. Right. That's everything yeah, you want. Fertilizer, no fertilizer. You just plant yeah. it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we're gonna pivot. Yeah, we're, we're gonna pivot. pivot here, Tim. <laughs> so he's making shit of me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've had quite a bit of discussion on CWD. Uh, can you guys give us just a quick update on where we're at on CWD across the state of Iowa, and, and then maybe even touch on Midwest if if uh, if you have that information. Yeah, so obviously chronic wasting disease still still an issue in Iowa. You know, we've talked a lot about that. Um, we've been working on managing it um, quite a bit. We do so every year. Right now we're mm -hmm. looking at, uh, what is it, 10 counties now, I believe, I in that's... Iowa where we've detected the disease. So down in, in this part of the world, uh, Wayne County uh, added one in Appanoose County this last year, Northwest Appanoose County, and then we've got the one in Decatur County, kind of right around uh, Leon. So those are our, our three counties down in, in this part of the world. Uh, obviously also up in Northeast Iowa and Almakee, Clayton counties where we've had the disease the longest. Uh, and then we have Woodbury County on the western side of the state, sure. so right around, right around the Sioux City area there. So um, obviously something we watch really closely every year and we've talked about this you know we're, we're relying on our hunters for for uh, collecting samples for our surveillance program every year uh, we're continuing to do that changing a little bit uh, on how we collect our samples um, this year we're shifting more towards a um, kind of a targeted or a priority weighted surveillance approach is what it's called where and I think we've discussed this on previous shows too but we know we know that um, certain ages and, and um, sexes of deer are, are higher risk for disease, so adult bucks are higher risk, and so we focus on collecting samples from, from those animals. And then obviously we know that there are certain areas of the state that are higher risk for disease too, places where we've detected it in the past or uh, places adjacent to the, those areas. And so we're, we're focusing our efforts more on, on, on those areas, trying to to continue to monitor the spread and the prevalence of the disease, but still collecting samples statewide because we want to be able to pick it up, <clears throat> pick it up when it shows up. 
you know, across the Midwest, we're, you know, it's similar story, basically, in our, our neighboring states, Minnesota, Nebraska, Missouri, <coughs> Wisconsin, I'll, all have chronic wasting disease and, and are all, um, you know, doing similar things to, to manage and, and monitor the, the disease. Um, but, you know, we're, we're still just trying to, to kind of test things and, and really see, see what, what works best for, for effective management. No significant scientific breakthroughs in, te in, in any of the testing or in any of the curing or, you know, vaccinations or anything like that? Nothing really recently, no. Um, you know, the, this uh, <clears throat> RT-Quick testing approach, or, or it's an amplification assay that's, uh, that's a pretty big topic of scientific research right now. It's a, essentially a quicker and more sensitive way to test deer for uh, for the disease and so there's a lot of active research uh, looking at that approach for uh, for testing and actually we've got a couple research projects here in Iowa in partnership with uh, Iowa State University that's u utilizing that that testing approach to to um, to essentially help us evaluate um, different ways in which we can we can monitor the disease and so that that's probably one I think area that's Seeing some really active research, I don't know that I would say there's been any breakthroughs yet, but it's really still just trying to figure out how we can make that that test, you know, commercially available essentially for for state agencies and hunters to use. Because yeah. again, that early detection is key, right? So the quicker we can get results back, and and the 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 more accurate those results are, is is really going to be important for us. Yeah, I remember how we kind of correlated this to the coronavirus, you know, exactly things right. really shifted, um, pivoted, Wooden would almost say, Tim. One, it really pivoted when the testing became, you know, so readily available for people right. With, right. with COVID. Yep. But, uh, Sorry, That's all right. really, uh, I used it one time in a in a podcast in the episode. Well, you know the old joke, which I can't do on the on the air here. But there's a joke to go with that. So anyway, so with that, uh, let me, I, was, I have one question. But so I have a couple. Of, last couple of years, I've had some emaciated deer, mm -hmm. and uh, so I have another one this year. Last year is a really nice buck. This year, it's a it's a doe, severely emaciated and. They have issues and i checked with one of my neighbors here the other day asking if he had seen anything like that and what's that mean if i see something like that what else could it be if it's not a cwd what what would that be yeah so the the challenge <clears throat> with it's really challenging to diagnose a deer on the hoof so to speak right sure. and, and for chronic wasting disease uh, you know essentially what happens is the deer looks sick and, and it could be for, for a lot of reasons. They start to get skinny, uh, you know, they start to, to kind of lose some of their, uh, their vigilance, you know, they're less wary, uh, maybe less scared of, of humans, they're salivating. All of these things could be, could be signs of, of chronic wasting disease, but they could be signs of, of, of a variety of other diseases. So things like um, meningeal worms or brain worms can cause um, can, conditions or, or signs like that, um, you know, some other injury or, or, or illness that's, that's going on that, that we just can't see, uh, you know, that, that happens oftentimes, um, as well. And, and then, you know, there, there are a lot of times where some deer just, you know, they're just looking skinny, you know, they, yeah. they just haven't, maybe they haven't been able to find the food that they need or, or something else is going on that, that we don't know about. And so, it, it's really challenging and we, you know we get questions I'm sure Heath gets them a lot too where we'll get photos on Facebook or you know photos sent to us it's well what's what's going on with this deer it looks skinny and it's really really hard yep. to, to say what it is but you know what we always recommend especially um, in areas where we know we've we've detected chronic wasting disease if you see a deer like that obviously it's a concern concern for us because if it is a deer that's infected with chronic wasting disease we want to, you know, to try to remove that deer from the landscape and, and get it tested to, sure. to see, see what's going on. And so, um, you know, we've recommended all along ever since we found the disease in the state that if you see a deer that looks sick, 
especially in our, in our disease management zones or in those counties where we've detected the disease, to, to give us a call, shoot us an email, let us know, and so that way we're aware of it. So let me bounce this off. If I see, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. If we see a deer that's severely emaciated, it's going to die. Can I go out and harvest that animal, even if it's out of season, to take it out of the population so that it would be available for testing? I know that's a big gray. That's a big. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a big gray zone. Maybe it's not even gray. <laughs> well, I, would, I think the first thing I would do, especially if you're seeing the deer on a regular basis, is just contact your local conservation officer, have him or her come out, take a look, and explain the situation. Sure. You know, I think just having that line of communication, and he might. I don't know exactly how they will handle it. He might be like, "Yeah, if it's land right there, go ahead and do that," or "I'm right down the road. I'll be there shortly." But I think it's better to have that figured out before you pull the trigger, sure. and then call because you just you just never know. You yeah. know, it's just I just have some sort of clear, you know, outcome or what what needs to happen before you before super, yeah. Super good coaching. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Message received, right? <laughs> and I think I think that's just something that we want to try to do as a department. You know, it's like we want to have communication with. A landowner, a hunter, or something before, or something like that, because, because you know it could go down some some road. We and as a department or other hunters want it to go. You know, well this deer looks sick, so I just shot. It. It's like yeah, you yeah. you get going down that slippery slope, and yeah, so. yeah that's super good coaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so we just talked CWD. So before we leave that um, perspective on, is there reasons for hope or Hey, we're really just trying to buy science time. Is that is that is that where we're at? Uh, where are we at on that continuum? Hope or buy us some time, buy science time. Oh, that's a another. You guys are good with the tough <laughs> questions. Yeah. You know what? I well, he I handled that last one in like a layup. I he mean. did. He said, I should let him handle this one. Too. I think we're still somewhere in the middle. Okay. You know uh, the re. I, the reality is, and I think we all know this, is CWD is not going away, right? I think it's something that we're going to have to, to live with and manage for, for years to come. Um, that being said, obviously, like we've mentioned, a very active area of research. Um, and, you know, we all saw what happened with, with COVID in the last year and a half, right? I mean, it was, we went from knowing essentially nothing about this, this disease to to knowing a heck of a lot about this disease in the, in the span of a year and a half, right? So yeah. science can do some pretty amazing things for us. And, and I can tell you there's a lot of people in the Midwest that are, that are researching every aspect of managing this disease, from how to effectively manage the population to, you know, how to remediate infected areas, you know, remediate the landscape of infected areas to these testing, different testing approaches. I mean, it's, it's just a really active area for research. So, so I, I think we're still somewhere in the middle. I, I, you know, I, I tend to be a bit more optimistic. I, I don't think we're, I don't think all hope is gone okay. yet, but, um, you know, just something that I think we need to, we need to stay vigilant continue monitoring, continue to explore new ways for, for managing the disease. And, and, you know, what we always say too is continue hunting. You know, we know that hunters are, are a, you know, a huge part of, of managing the deer population in Iowa and throughout the Midwest for that matter, and, and play a huge role in, in managing for this disease and monitoring the disease. So uh, always recommend or, or encourage people keep hunting um, you know, we appreciate Hunter's cooperation with, with, with sampling, and, and we, we hope that that can continue because that, that's going to be the key to, to continue managing this disease. Okay. Um, so, hey, let's move on to the next, uh, our next probably most prominent disease in Iowa from a whitetail perspective, EHD. Um, we had any big outbreaks this year that you're aware of? I have not heard of any... I know we always have some some cases of EHD across the state, but nothing like it was two years ago, I think it was. But luckily, you know, most of the state's been in a drought, but down here in this neck of the woods where the majority, well, where a lot of the deer are at, it's it's been pretty pretty good, you know, 
rainfall wise you know it was dry there for a while but i personally haven't heard of any any ehd outbreaks i'm sure there's one or two here which there is always here or each year but nothing like a couple of years ago where it was there was a lot of deer dying from ehd because yeah, it's news. usually associated to like like drying really super dry years right <laughs> yeah Is drought that, drought years were the essentially were like the mud the yeah, pools the, and these the, flies the midges live in that mud so when the deer come to get a drink out of the shallower area than normal the yeah the midges will, yeah. will yeah. bite the deer and then and it usually seems about this time of year maybe a couple more weeks yeah it's usually this time of year august you start seeing or hearing about it yeah. or whatever right yeah it's usually when the guys are finding the big bucks you know so they're still in velvet but they're almost out to you know they're done growing is that what i kind of remember time frame wise so yeah okay. in the next couple of weeks late august you know mid to late august is when usually when a lot of the outbreak or when we hear a lot of the so i don't know what what you guys have experienced down here but remember so ehd's you know transmitted by those biting biting insects and we have it's been so dry in central iowa at least where i where i live that we have had essentially no biting insects this year i mean i can probably count on one hand the number of mosquito bites that i've gotten in in central iowa in fact i came down here to do a little bit of work on some of heath's properties here a couple weeks ago and i was like holy smokes that's right this is what in, this is what mosquitoes feel like again because we have had essentially nothing in in central iowa and so um you know the fact that we haven't heard about any ehd cases yet i guess to me is not all that surprising because we just at least in some parts of the state the biting insects aren't there they're not there to transmit the disease right Interesting. so we did i think time will tell right as 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 you guys mentioned this is this is kind of the time when we start hearing about those cases usually late july through mid-august and so um but i i like heath have not received any reports yet yeah so. i'll speculate that there probably won't be a lot of cases in the southern part of the state you know a lot i mean all the ponds are full all the little water i mean we've you know have had pretty good rainfall in the last month when you know usually when these cases kind of break out so Fingers crossed. Hopefully everything will be good in this neck of the woods as yeah, it comes really to have. EHD. Yeah, this knock year. on wood, I hope so too. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's always frustrating watching <laughs> one of your target bucks or one of those deer that needs one more year you're really hoping for, you know, die from a, a mosquito bite or, you know, a midge bite, you know. It's, yeah. it's frustrating. Well, you just see and watch so many videos of deer floating in ponds and mm -hmm. people finding four or five deer in a creek you know or you know because they're usually around water somewhere it's just it's just sad yeah. it's really sad yeah any other diseases i'm missing that pre predominantly for a white tail no those are really the two primary ones that you know that we hear about or or work to manage on an annual basis so chronic wasting disease and hemorrhagic disease all right so i do have a couple more questions i know that surprises you uh so if we're if we're looking at white tail which we're, we're looking at white tail uh and so from a from a buck to doe ratio I, i've read tons of stuff on buck to doe ratios what what's ideal what, what's your guys' experience yeah i mean a lot of guys a lot of research that i've done and looked into is everybody wants a one-to-one -one ratio you know that's ideal but that's pretty tough to get to you know i'd say probably two to one or three to one is probably more realistic in this part of the world when it comes to buck to doe ratio and obviously having too many does can negatively affect um you know we talked about the fawn the different sizes of fawns you got too many does on a landscape and then your your rut is longer and longer and those are getting bred not in a two-week window but like a two-month window what can you know fawn drop predator swamping i don't know if you guys have ever heard that term before I have not it what is goes right next to toady yeah, yeah. Toadies <laughs> on, yeah. educate us on predator swamping so essentially you know uh any prey species wants to try to have their young at the same time of year so like when it comes to does they want to get bred let's say the first two weeks in november is ideal so that means all your fawns are essentially dropping in a 10 to 14 day window so when you put all of those fawns out on the landscape at the same time, it's harder for your, your predators. You know, in this part of the world, it's mostly coyotes, maybe some bobcats, things like that, where there's, there's so many of those young fawns out there, 
they can't get to them all. So the survival of the species will continue. But if you spread those out, let's say you got 10 here this week, 10 there that week, you know, it's easier to target those, those fawns at that real critical age. You know, it's, it's essentially the same thing that birds do and everything too. They all try to nest at the same time. So, you know, there will be some sort of survival so the predators can't seek out those sure. those few fawns huh. or whatever is hitting the ground at the same time. That makes sense. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I like, I like using the analogy sense. kind of like an oak tree. You know, it drops all its acorns essentially in the same at the same time frame. Yeah, if it dropped 10 acorns every day, well, deer, squirrels, everything, I mean, you're not going to have any oak trees, you know, new oak trees. Where if they drop a 1,000 at all at one time, something's going to survive. Yeah. Yeah. So That makes total sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I do have a question for both you guys. So, my understanding is the hunting population, people that go out and actively hunt, is decreasing. Is that still true for our area and across the United States? Yeah, if you look at long-term trends. So, with it decreasing, do we, and hunters are a valuable resource with regards to managing populations no oh, matter yeah. no matter what species we talk about right? right right so as as that continues to move forward do we see a do we see how we manage the herd and hunting changing in the future did i say that right you yeah. know if i've got a decreasing population i might have to change my practices from a hunting perspective to make sure i manage the herd right Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, hunter participation has gradually gone down over the last, you know, 10 years or so. And we're trying to do as much as we can with the the R3 um, within the Midwest and even with Iowa. But, you know, as a state level, I think what we try to do is try to provide as much access as we can to those hunters that are out there. So, um, you know, whether or not that be buying or acquiring more public land so guys have more area to go to or even the IHAP program working with private landowners to allow public hunting on some of their areas too it's it's a struggle you know because you know obviously deer hunting has changed a lot especially in southern Iowa in the last 10 to 15 20 years where back in the day you could go knock on anybody's door and they allow you hunt and now it's you know there's there's a lot of leasing and bigger landowners where it's it's tough to get to some of those deer populations because they're kind of isolated. So it's a, it's a constant struggle, especially with, you know, hunter pop, or hunter hunter participation going down and just the dynamic of deer hunting in general and how it's changed, you know, it's, it's a struggle. So we're just continuing to try to figure some of that stuff out and now and into the future, so. Yeah, I don't know if I have much to add to that other than that, like Keith mentioned, we're just constantly trying to, to look at additional opportunities that we can provide to hunters um you know to to um encourage them to get out and 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 take advantage of of iowa's great outdoors and and also starting to you know think a bit creatively about um and we've you know we've done this for for several years about about how to 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 help our hunters help us manage the population you know whether that be with with additional seasons like the January antlerless only season that we've talked about on previous episodes, Um, you know, things like that, opportunities that that we can provide to hunters, because obviously we want to be able to provide recreational opportunity, but, but um, you know, for, for deer, it's really hunting is, is really how we manage the population, probably more so than, than some of the other hunting species in the state. So, so it's a really, really critical role that, that hunters, uh, play for us and and we're lucky in Iowa to have a population of hunters that that you know for the most part in years past have been super just super at helping us do that uh, you know I, I think if I spoke to some of my other colleagues in in the Midwest um, you know they they um, they might not sh- share that sentiment to the to the extent that uh, that we have here in Iowa and so we're just really lucky to have a great group of hunters here that that uh, when, when we need help managing a population, um, they they answer the call. So That's great. All right, so I, I have one more question. It's kind of, so they're going to start shedding their velvet when, and uh, I've heard rumors that, hey, how they shed their, when they shed their velvet, how they 
how they shed their velvet also impacts the color of the antlers. Is all that true? Uh, so first part of the question is when will they start losing their velvet? Sure. I think most of the time, it's part later part of August, you know, cause youth season comes around, you know, that's September 15th, 18th, yep. usually that yep. time frame. And most of the deer are hard horned or hard antlered by that time. Um, in regards to how they shed it, if it changes their antler color, I don't. I don't know if I've seen that. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I think some of that is genetics too. You know, kind of what their what their antlers might look like. Sure. Um, yeah, I I know when they start to rub, in you know in the October months, there might be some, you know, bark material stuck within their antlers that might change the outlook of their of their coloration a little bit, but. Um, I don't know if how they shed it necessarily affects the color. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. What, what's, uh, it sounds like you have a toady theory here. No, uh, you know, I, what, what I had heard was, and again, you know, everybody's got an opinion on something, right? Is, is that, uh, um, depending on how the antlers have shed out, um, if they hit, when they go to start rubbing on their antlers and et cetera, that, the blood from the the blood from the velvet if it doesn't just completely fall off if it sticks around you know and it's still stuck to their antlers when they go to start rubbing they're rubbing that color into the antlers and that's why oh. it's a color uh, but going back to where Heath's talking about that that actually makes more sense to me genetically versus that theory because otherwise I'd have splotch, splotchy colors right if it was a blood if it was blood and there was some velvet sitting there versus genetic, it would be all the way through. So, right. I don't know. I think most of the time with that velvet, when they start to lose it, you know, it's it's not it's done growing and then the next day it's falling off. I think there there shouldn't be any live tissue within that velvet when they start to to Drop shed it. it. So, yeah, I don't. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I don't think how they rub it and how it hangs on there changes the coloration of the antlers themselves. Speaking to that, do most of your most of your antlers are they are they uh, bright bright white or they're, or yeah. are they or are they different? Well, I mean, we got a list right there. You know, I've got I would say the majority of them are on the whiter side, whiter side. Mm -hmm. um, but I've I've also got some pictures I haven't seen personally. I've got pictures of at least one or two that are like chocolate, you know, very chocolate brown. Yeah, <laughs> like uh, Lamont. Yeah. Yeah, just, it's it's interesting. It's interesting. the genetics are just crazy to watch year after year after year. You know, it's just it's neat to see. It is fun. Uh, the different stuff going on. But any other questions, Timbo? I don't actually. Well, if this was a MMA fight or a UFC fight, you know, the guy with the mic and it's time, right? That guy that's screaming, yell. I'm not going to scream into the mic, <laughs> but it's time. Predictions for hunting season this year. We talked fawns. We've you know, we've talked surveys, we've we've been out and about and uh, stuff like that. What are your guys' predictions on the whitetail hunting this year? I guess I'll just go first anecdotally, just being out doing what I do on a regular basis. I mean, I've seen a lot of good healthy does. I've seen a lot of twins, a lot of fawns. I've also seen quite a few bachelor groups with, you know, some pretty decent bucks in it. And then we also touched a little bit on EHD and how we haven't had any cases in this neck of the world and we're getting to the point where we should have some historically when those cases come in but we're sitting pretty good precipitation wise so i feel like it's going to be a pretty good year i know tyler and i were talking a little bit on the way here about with last year harvest was up a little bit with everything covid wise you know a lot more hunters out there so i guess i'll turn it over to him kind of see what his predictions are yeah i share i share heath's thoughts i think i you know, from what I've seen this year, we've had good good production. I've been seeing deer on the landscape. Um, you know, some folks might be a bit concerned with what we were talking about earlier with potential winter impacts last year. And we did see some winter impacts on population, you know, reports of dead deer in some areas. But uh, but for the most part, I, I would suspect we'll, we'll chug right along again, uh, you know, right around that 100,000 statewide harvest um, this year. We, we did see a big jump in license sales last year because of COVID, um, likely. And uh, we'll, you know, we'll kind of see how that, how that plays out. 
again this year of course that was a trend that we saw across all all hunting license sales turkey license small game license so uh, so we'll see what what happens again this year but um and, but i would suspect we'll we'll stick right there at the kind of the hundred thousand mark which is in in my opinion right right where we want to be from a population standpoint so so i mean i, I don't my small snapshot also from a food production perspective the oak trees are full a lot of a lot of mass out there yeah um, and from a crop standpoint at least this part of iowa i mean it's it's gonna be a bumper real good yeah yep. yeah so you know if sales the question would be and i think it's a question mark if sales and harvest stays the same you know that doesn't necessarily indicate what the population of deer looks like right so it's a pretty good indicator, but it's okay. not it's not the whole story, right? Which yeah. is why we have some of our other surveys that we do. Thought being, you know, if harvest stays the same but the population goes up, then are we kind of on an incline from a total population of deer going forward. So Right. But it kind of balances out over year. It's an average, right? It does, yeah. And we've been right at one hundred thousand more or less on average, maybe slightly trending up from that the last you know, eight, ten years. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Any questions that we should have asked or, you know, any thoughts on your guys' mind? Now would be the time to share them with our audience. Good on my end. Thanks for for having me down. This has been fun. Absolutely. Yeah, always fun. Well, with that, we'll close out. Be safe. Safe, Have have fun. fun. And get outdoors. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be be safe, safe, have have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors.